I would like to welcome you today to the 2023 NNLM Virtual Symposium on Health Misinformation. We are really glad that you can join us today, and I hope you've been able to attend some of the sessions earlier that from that started earlier today. But if not, we'd just like to welcome you for this one. I'm Margie Shepard. I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator for Region 3 of the Network of the National Library of Medicine. Our regional medical library is located at the University of North Texas Health Science Center in Fort Worth, Texas. However, I am based out of the University of Kansas Medical Center in Kansas City, Kansas. We have just a few technical items to cover before we get into our uh, presentation. All attendees have been muted, but we do welcome your questions and comments in the, in the Zoom chat at any time. VFAIRS is providing technical assistance today, and NMLM staff will be keeping an eye on the chat with me. We also have the Q&A um, enabled for this presentation, so if you would like to put your questions in there, we will be monitoring that as well. Uh, please be sure to select everyone from the drop-down menu when posting your comments in the chat to ensure that everyone sees them. And we have in we also have uh, live closed captioning available for this event. You can access the closed caption by clicking on the icon at the bottom of your screen. If you would like to share on social media, we encourage you to use the hashtag for the event, Health Misinfo NNLM. Before we get started, I'd like to share a little bit about who we are. The National Institutes of Health is the nation's leading medical research agency. Many of you might be more familiar with the National Center for Allergies and Infectious Disease, which is one of the many institutes and centers at NIH. NLM, or the National Library of Medicine, is one of the 27 institutes and offices of the National Institutes of Health. It is the world's largest biomedical library and produces online resources like PubMed and MedLine Plus. And an LM, or the Network of the National Library of Medicine, is an outreach program of NLM working to ensure health professionals and, pu and the public have equal access to health information. And an LM is made up of seven regional medical libraries, three national offices, and four national centers, all providing training, funding and engagement opportunities to over 9,000 NNLM member organizations. It is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Cliff Coleman. Dr. Coleman is an international expert in the field of health literacy. His award-winning work focuses on improving health literacy and clear communication training for healthcare professionals. Cliff is an Associate Professor of Family Medicine at the Oregon Health and Science University School of Medicine, where he serves as Clinical Thread Director for Education on Health Communication, Professionalism, and Ethics. In 2021, Cliff became the inaugural Doris and Mark Storms Chair in Compassionate Communication at the OHSU Center for Ethics in Healthcare. In, his, in this role, he hopes to establish a new standard for clear communication training for all health professionals. So right now I'm going to stop sharing my screen and pass this over to Dr. Coleman. All right. Thank you so much, Margie. Um, what a, I'm really honored to get to be here with you all today and people from all over the country and probably outside the U.S. Um, but thank you for inviting me. Um, I, I am going to start to share these slides here and just a moment okay hopefully you'll see my slides come up there so as Margie said I'm gonna I'm a health literacy expert and 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 more specifically I'm an expert in the area of clear communication training for healthcare professionals but I wanted to use that perspective to help us think about this question around misinformation from a slightly different angle and to do that, I'm gonna actually narrow our focus quite a bit today to not only narrow it down to the idea around vaccine hesitancy, but specifically COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy, just to help us get our hands around what are otherwise these really big um, topics that, that may be hard for us to, to um, digest. So I, I don't have any uh, conflicts to disclose. 
Our session objectives, I believe you have, but I'll just go through them really quickly here. Um, first is to describe some ways that health literacy can influence vaccine hesitancy, and then to identify some of the specific literacy challenges that people face when they're trying to, to make decisions around their health, in our case here around vaccination. And then lastly, to look at some clear communication strategies, which can help us kind of um, uh, develop sort of a frame shift in the way we're thinking about um, vaccine hesitancy uh, and as it links up with uh, information or misinformation, I should say. What I'm not gonna cover today are things around vaccine effectiveness, vaccine safety, uh, the who should get vaccinated and when, uh, issues around vaccine policy and, and nothing around treatment of COVID-19 infection. The outline will be this, we'll try to follow this relatively closely. Um, we'll talk most first about uh, vaccine hesitancy uh, and then we'll get into health literacy specifically. We'll then combine those two concepts uh, and then lastly, leave with some communication strategies, and I'll give you some, some um, scenario examples of those. But um, really importantly, I want to leave time for us to have some discussion at the end. Uh, so let's get right into it. Vax COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy. Now, I, I'm going um, I'm to, as soon as I get started here, I'm going to pause for just a moment. I, I'm showing you a picture here uh, uh, off the Oregon coast. This is a little town called Cannon Beach and in the distance there uh, is a, a thing called Haystack Rock. And I'm just putting this picture up to remind me to, to slow down for a minute and um, to just acknowledge the fact that the issues around COVID-19 and specifically around vaccination have been very polarizing uh, in our country and around the world, in fact. And it's very easy, uh, I think, for uh, whichever side of argument you may find yourself on, uh, it's very easy to um, to uh, kind of vilify the, the other side of the argument. If you're pro-vaccine, it's very easy to find fault in people who are vaccine hesitant. Likewise, if you're a person who's having a hard time deciding about vaccination, it's very easy to find fault in people who are pushing for vaccination. And I just want to make sure and acknowledge that and ask all of us, myself included, to really be careful to suspend judgment as we try to think about this issue. And instead of, um, anytime we're feeling judgment coming up, I'd like you to try to replace that with curiosity and ask, why is this happening? And why are people making decisions that they, that they make? Um, so I'll come back to that theme as we move along here. So I wanted to show you a little 10 second clip of a person who um, I think is demonstrating vaccine hesitancy in one particular way. Yeah, I don't, I'm not going to get the COVID vaccine. I don't feel like I, I don't know. I just feel like I'm good. I don't need to. I take vitamins and whatnot, and I'm, I'm pretty healthy, so. So he may actually not be vaccine hesitant. He may have actually firmly decided not to accept vaccination. We don't know that. I'll come back to that idea in just a minute here. But again, this the idea about bringing curiosity to what we just heard. What is it about this person's understanding that allows him to feel confident in his decision-making. There's the, the text for that. Now, we can define vaccine hesitancy in this way. We'll call it any delay in acceptance or refusal of vaccination, despite the availability of the vaccine. So basically, it's any, any person who's having a difficult time deciding what to do. And that will, I'll just point out that that's different. This is different than vaccine equity, which is a completely different topic for another day. Now, um, just to ground us in current, the current statistics of today, this is, these are data from about a week ago that showed us that uh, in the United States, about 21% of, of the adult population has not received the primary series for COVID-19 vaccines, meaning those initial first vaccines. 80% of people who are currently eligible for the newest updated booster vaccine have not received it. Only 20% of, of eligible people have received it. And of the um, older adults, 65 and over, who are in more vulnerable population, 58% of that population uh, have not received the most current updated bi bivalent booster. So you can see there's a lot of capacity here for um, for vaccine services to be uh, expanded, uh, uh, but 
we are, clearly we're going to identify that, that that hesitancy is going to be a big a big barrier to much of that. Now, this idea around vaccine hesitancy is really a spectrum or a continuum. And so, what I'm showing here is a is a graphic where on the left hand side there's a large body of people who are, in generally speaking, willing to accept uh, vaccine recommendations in general. So you suggest they get a vaccine and they say, sure, if you recommend it, I will do it. And on the right-hand side, there's a smaller group of people who are, will essentially refuse all vaccinations. If, you, if we recommend them, they, they will refuse any of them. In between is this, is this kind of the, the continuum or the spectrum of people who are not totally sure and are, are perhaps having a hard time deciding. And that's the area that we're going to focus in on today. Now, there's a whole bunch of reasons why a person might not have tr might have trouble deciding: fear, not understanding, mistrust, low health literacy, low science literacy, religious beliefs, um, denial, politicization. We've seen quite a bit of um, access to quality information, prior experiences, needle phobia, all kinds of reasons why a person may have a hard time deciding what to do about a vaccine recommendation. Right, and so we'll come back to this theme um, uh, in a in a little bit here. But just to point out that it's really um, that there's that there's a whole the whole range of reasons, uh, and that may be combined for individuals. Before we get into that further, um, let's make our distinction here between misinformation and disinformation. And the CDC has given us this helpful um, this, this helpful set of definitions. Um, we'll consider misinformation in this sense to be really false or incorrect or inaccurate information, but not information that's being used maliciously or um, to purposefully deceive. In contrast to disinformation, which is incorrect or false information, which is being used to purposefully de deceive. We're, gonna, we're not gonna talk about disinformation today. We're gonna talk about misinformation, trouble understanding or, or incorrect understanding. I'm showing here are a couple of um, uh, screenshots from print media sources. One is a, an article in the Atlantic and another is an article in the Los Angeles Times. These both came out in 2021. And these are um, op-ed reports, uh, uh, essentially um, describing experiences in, within the healthcare, with healthcare workforce. So one of the uh, titles here is Vaccine Refusers Risk Compassion Fatigue. And the other is um, op-ed, as a doctor in a COVID unit, I'm running out of compassion for the unvaccinated. Get the shot. What we're seeing is that people who are having a difficult time deciding about whether to accept vaccination or not, or, or of course, are, are going to have to face potential health risks or issues related to that. But on the other side of, uh, of the equation, we're seeing that the healthcare workforce is also impacted by these issues around vaccine hesitancy. In fact, a colleague of mine uh, interviewed a, uh, an ICU nurse in our region here who said, in relation to vaccine hesitancy, I can't find my empathy anymore. So, so really what we're seeing is that this, this issue has real life impacts on patients' health and wellness, but it's also impacting the healthcare workforce. None of this is good for anyone. Um, and so it gives us reason to try to figure out how to work through this in a different or perhaps better way. Now this picture is, a, uh, is of Dr. Kizmikia Corbett, who you, you may recall was the woman who led uh, the team at NIH who developed the Moderna COVID-19 vaccine. And she said something really important early on, which was that when you label someone as hesitant, it's disregarding the fact that there's a reason why the person has decided not to get the vaccine. There are always reasons. And again, this just comes back to this idea around curiosity. It's very easy for us to just write someone off who's making a who's made their decision, but that has only gotten us to where we're at right now. And if we're going to try to break through some of this, we need to figure out how to op open ourselves back up to that curiosity question. So I'm going to use this kind of model to help us a little bit think about some of these issues today. And what I'm showing here are four overlapping circles in a Venn diagram kind of model. This model is not a not one that's been tested and it hasn't, it, it's just my way of organizing my thinking for our purposes today. But what we've got here is that the top circle is health literacy. 
The bottom circle is trust. Those two are definitely linked. But on the right, the left-hand side, we've got a circle that's that's about religious beliefs and values. And on the right, we've got political beliefs and values. And I think the four of these things come together in the center here to help us kind of understand vaccine hesitancy in a, in a fairly simplistic model. I think the real model is much more complicated than this, but for our purposes for today. Now, I'm gonna simplify it even further by saying that the, the issues around religious beliefs and values and the political beliefs and values, I don't think we know how to access those very well. I certainly don't think we know how to engage with those issues in a, a very effective way yet. And so for our purposes today, what I'd like to do is just, I'm gonna set these aside. And I'm gonna leave us with a extremely simple model of just health literacy overlapping with trust and vaccine hesitancy being an outcome of those two interactions. So what is health literacy? Let's define it uh, the way Healthy People 2030 defines it as the ability to find, understand, and use health information and services to achieve one's goals. Fairly simple. All right. Now, you may know in the United States, we have a very large health literacy issue. These are, I'm showing you here some data that um, were developed by the U.S. Department of Education in their National Assessment of Adult Literacy. And in the red outlined area here and in the, the top purple bar, what we're seeing is that around 36% of US adults have very low health literacy skills at their at baseline as a starting point. So we're seeing that 14% of US adults have below basic skills and 22% have basic skills. You put those two together and that's that 36%. And those are skills that are really considered inadequate for dealing with the typical usual kinds of information that people encounter through engaging the healthcare system let alone the more complex type of stuff that's gonna come around vaccines uh, and, the, and the like. So, so at baseline, about a little over a third of US adults have low health literacy. The rest of, uh, of adults, this 53% with intermediate skills and 12% with proficient skills, that, that group is also at risk for not understanding health information during times of stress, when they're sick, they're worried, they're in pain, they haven't slept well. Um, so. So all of us can experience low health literacy um, given the right conditions. Now, that's for this is for all comers. This is for the U.S. Popu the adult population in general. There are many um, other groups within the, the United States who experience even higher rates of, of low health literacy, and I've got those listed here. Um, so disproportionately affected groups include people with less education, um, lower income, people who are older, 65 and over particularly, people who identify as Black, American Indian, Alaska Native, or Hispanic, uh, English, people who have learned English as a second or other language, and people who have or are experiencing higher rates of chronic disease. All of these can, populations um, tend to have a higher percentage uh, in, this, in this low health literacy group. Now, why is that so important? Well, that is the exact same group, set of, set of communities, who were disproportionately impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, right? The, these are communities that suffered um, greater losses during um, the pandemic than other, than other communities. And this isn't a causal linkage here, it's just a, an observation that these two groups look very similar. Well, I wanna just take a, a, about two minutes or a minute and a half and just listen to the, the voices of, uh, of a number of people talking about their experiences um, in healthcare and having a difficult time understanding uh, what was going on. And this is an excerpt from a longer video that was produced by the American Medical Association um, uh, a while back now. The quality, the video quality is not great, um, uh, but I would encourage you if you're interested to check out the full length uh, video and the, the citation is at the end of the slides there. I, I was sick a lot. I was sick a lot because I probably missed dosage and didn't realize it. Um, I was in the hospital a lot. When they did give me medicine, I didn't take it right. I admit to it. I just didn't understand them, and I didn't have the nerve to ask them the right way of doing it. Mm -hmm. I just didn't have the nerve to ask them, and I didn't want anyone to know I couldn't read. We had a child that was physically handicapped that I had to do physical therapy on. I would show up on Tuesdays 
instead of Thursdays for the appointment. I would be exercising the wrong side of the body. I had an abscess in a ear one time. Well, I had to fill out forms and I couldn't fill out, so I didn't go. I come back home. I ended up having to go to the emergency room that night because it burst. Can you imagine what it's like um, you being a patient and sick and uh, you know that you have limited skills, okay? And you're talking to an intelligent doctor like mm -hmm. yourselves. And these people are, are using words that you really don't know because they're not speaking in layman's term, okay? Right. Most doctors are just presuming that everybody's intelligent as they are, and that is just not the case. So what you do, you come out of that, uh, that, that room, that examination room with this intelligent woman or man thinking, God, I hope I don't make a mistake with my medicine because I did not understand anything he or she said to me. So, so we're hearing that, that this is a very articulate group of people who are explaining how they really couldn't, had a hard time understanding, but, but at the same time were um, hesitant to share their lack of understanding with the, with the healthcare professionals that they were working with. Let's look at this idea around um, literacy and the demands that we put on people all the time. And, and some of the examples that came out of that video, we'll, we'll see in this. Now, literacy and health literacy, both are complicated constructs. Here we can see that there's like six domains um, uh, under this uh, way of looking at literacy. We've got reading and writing skills. Uh, and along with those, we've got this notion of what's called numeracy, which is the basic use of numbers and math, 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 basically in conversation. And we'll see some examples of that and how important that is when we're starting to talk about vaccines and, and risk and things like that. These have been grouped a, a, under uh, a category called print literacy. Then we've got listening and speaking skills, the ability to, to, to share information verbally, uh, receive information verbally, um, et cetera. We'll call that oral literacy skills. And then on the far left, we've got this thing called cultural and conceptual knowledge, which is what does a person know? What have they learned throughout their lives? And it turns out that people who have, have lower literacy and lower health literacy skills um, have spent less time reading, have read less stuff, and, is, and essentially have learned less at least of that book knowledge that many of us have relied on for making health-related decisions. So let's look at some examples here. Uh, we, a person who's trying to make some decisions around whether or not to receive a vaccine has a lot of oral literacy demands being put on them. They have to be able to discuss the risks and benefits of vaccination, be able to understand the jargon and terminology that's being used um, to try to help um, uh, share information with them, be able to process and understand news reports they may be hearing, and then being able to formulate their own clear questions to get the answers that they need in order to make the right decision for themselves. Those are all kind of oral literacy um, skills that are required. We could think about print literacy skills and, and demands as well, right? Uh, being able to benefit from the written information you receive, like a vaccine information sheet, which I'm gonna show you one of here in just a minute. Being able to judge print media reports of picking up a newspaper or a magazine and being able to understand and make sense of that information. And then lastly, this idea around the, the cultural and conceptual knowledge piece. And again, if, if you're a person with lower literacy skills and you've spent less time reading and learning um, through, through written materials, do you have the necessary understanding around things like germ theory? This idea that there's these things out there that you can't see, but that can in, infect a person and then leave that person and spread to another person. Do you know enough to understand about how vaccines work, what they do, and really what they don't do. We'll come to some examples of that. And then risk and prevention. These are mathematical concepts that are very complicated. And, and I'm gonna sh show you some data around numeracy in the US and we'll start to understand why that, these are really critical to people who are trying to decide about prevention and why we have such an uphill um, issue to deal with there. If we wanna think about vaccine literacy specifically, um, 
probably the key thing there for me is, is around this idea of numeracy and ability to understand things like probability and risk. Now, I already told you that about 36% of US adults have low health literacy, but when we look at um, national level data around numeracy, it's about two thirds, 64% of US adults have low numeracy skills. So, so we're really faced with a huge challenge here when we're starting to try to talk about prevention and, and, and those kinds of things. So we're gonna now bring these two together um, and look at how we can think about vaccine hesitancy through this health literacy lens a little bit more clearly. And I'll start with a quote. Um, this group uh, really, I think, nailed this by saying that, um, at, by observing that the arrival of a first in a lifetime pandemic created a sudden need for average people to find and process large amounts of complicated and rapidly evolving information. And this is really the problem. And I mean, I could say that for myself, uh, being a physician trying to keep up with the information was very challenging. Um, and so for someone without that similar kind of training, um, I can imagine that this posed quite a big problem for, for a large portion of the populace. Let's think about the language that came out, right? Suddenly overnight, as the pandemic emerged, overnight, people's vocabularies had to start growing quickly. Antibodies, asymptomatic, boosters, close contacts, contagions, droplets, endemic, hand hygiene, herd immunity, incubation, intubation, uh, life support, N95, pandemic, quarantine, risk, shedding, social distancing, vaccine, variant, et cetera. All of a sudden, all these all this language that had been really relegated to the kind of public health sphere to a large extent, suddenly everyone needed to figure out how to incorporate a, a huge amount of knowledge and, and vocabulary into their working lives in order to try to start making sense of what they were hearing and seeing in, in conversations with, with, with others. So that posed a huge challenge. And, and it came uh, at a time when the population was really starting from a, a, a pretty low level of basic understanding and basic science knowledge. So uh, before the pandemic hit, uh, some data uh, showed that, for example, in 2018, so a, a little over a year before uh, the pandemic started, in a nationally represented sample of adults, 50% of adults believed that antibiotics kill viruses as well as bacteria, which is not true. Uh, antibiotics kill bacteria, they do not kill viruses, but half of our population did not know that. Around that same time, a different study showed that 28% of adults got all five out of five true-false questions about influenza wrong. And one of those questions was that the flu vaccine can cause the flu, which it cannot. People can have a reaction to the vaccine, but they can't ca catch the infection. So you can see where we were starting from. Then we can look at, well, how did knowledge expand as the pandemic um, took off? So the Annenberg Public Policy Center did a series of surveys of, of again, of nationally representative surveys of US adults. Uh, and they surveyed folks at three different points in time. The first in March and April of 2021, then again, June of that year, and then again in November of that year. And they asked the same questions in each of these surveys to try to track um, essentially knowledge acquisition over time of the population. So I'll show you five of the questions that they asked. The first one they asked was, um, do, basically they asked, you know, do you, do you know that vaccines are effective? And, uh, and over all three of the, the survey points, around a quarter of respondents essentially either didn't know that they were affected or, or didn't believe that they were effective. And that held fairly steady. Then they asked, do you know that the vaccines cannot cause the COVID-19 infection? And they, they only asked that in those first two uh, survey date, surveys, but 31% um, and then 25% uh, did not know that the vaccine could not cause the illness or didn't, didn't know or didn't believe it. Then they asked, well, do you know that statistically speaking, 
getting the vaccine is safer than getting the infection. And again, around a quarter uh, didn't either know or didn't believe that that to be true. Then lastly, they asked them, do you know that the vaccines cannot change your DNA structure? And again, around a quarter uh, didn't know or didn't believe this. So think about this, right? We've got, we've got about right now 20% of the population who has not received the primary series. We've got about a quarter of the population who believes in one of these big barriers, right? How are you gonna, how are you gonna help a person make a decision about perhaps getting a vaccine if they think it's gonna change their DNA, that it's gonna potentially give them the infection, that it's going to um, be less safe than getting the natural infection, or that it, uh, it even works. So there's some of our challenges. Now, unfortunately, I don't think we rose to the occasion on trying to help explain things very well to people as we were figuring out what was happening as the pandemic started rolling along. For example, some of the ways that we, uh, materials that we developed to try to help educate people were very ineffective. And I'm gonna show you one of the least effective here, just as a, an extreme example. This is a, I'm sh what I'm showing you here is a um, vaccine information sheet for one of the vaccines that's available. And I'm just scrolling through it here to show you that it's nine pages long, full of text, very dense text, um, very hard to read. If a person was even willing to try to read this thing, to try to understand their vaccine that they were considering, what they'd discover was um, that as I put this text through a readability calculator, um, this would require somewhere between a 12th to 19th grade reading level to be able to read through it easily and understand it. Keeping in mind that the average adult in the US is reading around an eighth grade reading level. So most people are not even gonna be able to, to start and continue through this thing um, with any kind of success. If they do, what they're gonna encounter is a whole bunch of complicated jargon, which is gonna really, I think, um, challenge their confidence and their ability to understand what they're reading. So I really would just say that these, these vaccine information sheets you know, are, were not a useful tool. Um, and there were lots of other things that were perhaps better uh, tools. But this, I put this up as an extreme example for you. Now, one of the big challenges for us is that there's a, there's a linkage here between a person's ability to understand the information and their ability to trust the information and the person delivering it. So for example, in a study in 2021, nationally representative survey of US adults, half of adults said, it's hard to make sense of all the information about COVID-19 vaccines. I agree. They also said that the changes in the public health recommendations made them feel confused and it made them feel less confident in those officials' recommendations. Uh, so again, um, barriers to making decisions, right? Similarly, in that Annenberg Public Policy Center um, set of surveys that I showed you earlier, the, they asked people who had said, I'm not gonna get vaccinated. They asked that group, um, you know, can you tell us why? And some of the reasons people cited were things like, I wanna wait and see, this stuff's too new. I wanna see what, what's gonna happen. Some people said, I'm worried about what will happen to me physically if I get the shot. Some people said, I don't trust the government. I don't trust the drug companies who are making these vaccines. And then a third of people roughly said, I'm just not concerned about it. Like the man in the video at the beginning that we heard who's like, I'm not gonna get it, I'm pretty healthy. Well, we know a few things about, um, uh, about people who have lower health literacy and their understanding of COVID-19 and the vaccines. We know that the lower, People in lower health literacy groups are less knowledgeable about COVID-19 symptoms and the ways to prevent the infection. They're less able to find and understand information about COVID-19 online. They're more reliant on social media sources for news and information about COVID-19 than other sources. They are less worried about getting COVID-19 and they're less likely to think that they're gonna be a person who's gonna get it, like maybe like the man in the video. They're less likely to adhere to preventive behaviors like 
face coverings, um, hand washing, vaccinations, et cetera. And they're more likely to believe in the misinformation and conspiracy theories that are available uh, around COVID-19. So we've got this ch some challenges here. So now I wanna just switch and talk about some clear communication strategies that we might be able to use to uh, kind of overcome some of these challenges. And we'll start again with a quote here. Um, and this was uh, by an author named Finnegan who, who astutely noted that the work on reduce, or that we need to work on reducing the cost of changing one's mind about vaccination. Doing a U-turn doesn't feel good. And, and went on to, to say some more about that. But what I like about this is that is how it, um, it helps us realize that if a person has, is, has declared themselves as vaccine hesitant in the sense that they're, they've decided not to get vaccinated right now, there's a psychological cost to reversing that position. And that cost uh, is something that a lot of clinicians I don't think have taken into consideration. So I'm gonna show you a, an approach that I would use uh, here in just a moment of how to, to lower that cost for that individual to be able to change their mind and, and, um, and sort of save face, if you will. So I'll just take a minute here to walk through some of the ways that I would approach a person uh, in a clinical environment. So I'm a family physician. I work in a, uh, in a clinic and I encounter vaccine hesitancy every day. Uh, and so this is just my uh, particular way that I might approach some of this stuff. And then after I go through this, I'll actually um, show you a scenario of what it might look like in a more realistic setting. So first off, I come into it assuming that every person uh, is at risk for not understanding. And this is this notion that um, just because a person may have high baseline health literacy skills during times of stress, we all can have difficulty understanding our, our health literacy skills can go down at all at, at any given time. So this idea around a universal precautions approach to health communication is really important. I try to enter in with a um, a sense of non-judgmental cultural humility. Again, for me, that means really staying open to that curiosity position um, rather than that judgmental position. And I'll and I'll show you an example of that. I might say to the person, "Well, what are your current thoughts about the COVID nineteen? You know, the COVID nineteen vaccine. I notice you haven't been vaccinated. What are you thinking about it right now?" If the person says, "You know, I just I really don't want it. I'm really those those things are." Uh, I'm worried about it. You want to know, well, what is it that worries you about it, right? What is your current knowledge? So I might ask, well, what, what have you heard? What are you most worried about? To keep the, to get the, the conversation going. Again, these are curiosity questions. These are not questions that I'm going to use to position myself to make a specific argument, right? So after we've heard what what a person's concerns or fears or what they've heard, what's out there that they've heard, you might ask that we might ask permission to share uh, our own or, or my own position or my own understanding of the situation. And I ask permission to share because A, that gives a little bit more agency to the person who I'm speaking with, but also if I, I occasionally have people who are like, you know, I'm not, in, I don't want to hear about it and that's perfectly okay. Uh, and I won't push it beyond that. But I'll say, do you mind if I share my perspective here? And again, I'm going to show you an example of this in a minute. Now, at this point, I'm under really no uh, illusion that I'm going to miraculously change a, a person's har hard um, uh, stance on vaccination or COVID vaccines, right? Um, that I'm going to be able to, to overcome that cost that, that we were talking about of changing a person's mind. And that's not really going to be my goal. As someone who kind of understands motivational interviewing, I'm going to um, I'm going to try to open a person's mind up, but I'm not necessarily going to get try to get them to change their mind in the moment in that moment with me right there. What I am going to aim for is something I'll call informed refusal. Now I think we're really good at um, as, at, at obtaining informed consent when we're suggest when we're offering to do something to a person. Right, if we're going to 
put them into a research study or we're going to do some kind of operation or surgery on them. We're good at getting informed consent. So the person knows what they're getting into. I think we're really bad at getting informed refusal. And I think that comes from a place of us trying to honor individual's autonomy. And when a person says, no, I, I don't want the vaccine, I think most of us um, find it easy to say, okay, you know, it's your body, it's your decision, you're in charge, that's fine. You don't need to get the vaccine, right? But is that an informed decision or not? And what I think what we really could be doing a much better job of is saying, that's great. That's your decision. My job is to make sure that you're making that decision based on all the uh, relevant information that a person might want in order to make that decision so that I know that you're an informed consumer. When you use clear communication best practices, this comes out of the health literacy literature, things like avoiding unnecessary jargon, of which we saw some good examples of, um, in, uh, limiting information overload, uh, which is you know, not giving a person more information than they can process in a given moment. We'll use inter motivational interviewing if we know how to do that. And then again, trying to maintain that position of, of curiosity, that keeping an open mind, but also asking the, the patient or client to go ahead and keep an open mind as well. That's a fair, fair thing to ask. So, so that's kind of my overall structure, but let me just show you how this might play out in a, in a scenario. So what we're looking at here is a picture uh, of three people. We've got a, a young girl sitting on her mother's lap and they're speaking to a clinician who's got their back to us. Uh, and they look like they're in a clinical environment here and they're all wearing uh, face coverings. So this is this, first we're gonna talk about what the kind of the usual autonomy based approach might look like. So the clinician here might say, hey, can I offer her a COVID shot today? And the, the mother may say, well, not today. No, thank you. Um, and then honoring that autonomy, the clinician might say, well, okay, great. Well, let us know if you change your mind and then move on with whatever else they need to take care of uh, during this encounter. So that's the autonomy model. Let's flip it now and look at the informed refusal version of this, which might look like this. Uh, the clinician says, can I offer her a COVID shot today? And the mom says, no, not today. Thank you. Now the clinician might say, okay, but do you mind if I ask more about that? Get some permission, right? The, the mother says, no, I don't mind, go ahead. Okay, well, do you mind sharing why you don't wanna get the shot? Right? So we're, we're exploring here. And again, this comes from that place of curiosity. And if you're familiar with the ask, tell, ask model, this is the first ask in that model. So the mother might say something like, well, I'm pretty sure she's already had COVID and it really wasn't that bad. Uh, so, you know, why, why would I want to give her the shot? And so now the clinician can validate that by using some active listening, some reflective listening. So you're feeling like since she's probably had COVID, she won't get it again, or that it won't make her very sick if she does get it. Okay. Yeah. Right. Mom says, yeah, it's just a cold, right? It was, it was just a cold when she had it. Okay. So now we can validate again. We can say, well, I can see your point. Can I share my thoughts about the shot? About the shot, All right? So this is now um, getting permission again to share. So the mom says, "Please do." Okay. So now sharing. So my clinician may say, "Well, you're right. Kids her age are less likely to get very sick if they catch COVID, but it can happen. The shot's good at keeping her from getting very sick, but it's also good at helping protect the people she comes into contact with, like grandparents, who are more likely to get very sick." And so this is that sharing piece. And in ask, tell, ask model, this is the tell part of that. Okay. Now, the real hope here then is that uh, we haven't shut down the, the, the patient's mother, right? We haven't had her, had her uh, get more defensive about her position. We've, in fact, we've hopefully have opened up a, a place in her mind to, to kind of ask to think a little bit um, differently, perhaps, right? For her to be curious. Uh, and, and so here we see her kind of thinking, okay, hmm. And then we can leave it at that, right? We can say, well, now I hope, uh, I hope you'll think more about getting the shot for her and the people around her. Basically what we're saying is like, um, please keep an open mind and, uh, and we're here to give the, to give it the vaccine if you change, if you change your mind. Right. So the mom can say, well, I'll think about it. And now, um, 
the clinician being a good health literacy, health literate, clear communicator is going to close the loop by using a teach back technique and say, well, thank you. Now, so I can make sure that I've done my job well, could you please tell me in your own words why I'm recommending the COVID shot for her? Right? And this is in the ask, tell, ask model. This is the final ask is getting that, getting that closed feedback loop. All right. So what we've done here is we haven't gotten the person to accept a vaccine during this moment, but we've hopefully opened the, the door to thinking about it. And we've let them know that we're doing this in a non-judgmental way so that hopefully that creates space for them to, to think openly a little bit about it. So we're wrapping it up here. Um, so our, here again are, is our, uh, were our learning objectives for the session. Um, first, we wanted to be able to describe um, health literacy and how it influences vaccine hesitancy. I think we've done that. Identify some literacy challenges, we did that. And we just finished looking at some clear communication strategies. So now I'm gonna stop sharing and see if we've got some comments or some questions. Well, we do have a few questions, Carolyn. Do you want to field those or would you like me to? Oh, doesn't matter. I can go ahead and do that. Okay. Um, one of the questions we have is how do you think perceived risk plays a role in getting the vaccine or not? Yeah. Oh. Perceived risk, risk is <laughs> risk is one of those uh, is the hardest thing I think to understand in in all of um, health communication. Quite honestly, um, it is a is rooted in complicated mathematical understanding, and people with lower education and with lower numeracy skills, I I think have a very difficult time connecting with the concepts of risk. I can say, you know, as a person who's gone through medical school, I, I remember really working hard to try to understand what risk was. And it took me a lot, it took a long time. And I think that's true for my classmates as well. So it, it it's hard to expect um, people who don't have a lot of math, uh, formal math education to, to really connect with the idea right away. I suspect that we can figure out ways to use analogies and other um and other kind of real world examples to help people understand risk. One of the really interesting uh, areas of research in health literacy uh, has been around using icon arrays as a visual to help people recognize risk. Um, and I think there's a lot of potential there, although it's a really, a, it's still an emerging area. Um, but but um, maybe, the, maybe the best thing we can do is to try to elicit from the person what they perceive risk to be, um, to help us know kind of where to start, uh, and then try to stay curious and then try to be creative in how we try to explain it. Because I think if we go fall back on mathematical concepts, it, 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 we can talk ourselves in circles pretty quickly. Um, maybe going to visual representations like icon arrays is the, is the next step. Did that answer that question? I think so. Um, I wanted to ask another question to tag on to that. Uh, what do you think about storytelling, uh, you know, where people can relate to um, like a narrative versus just facts? Yeah. It, regarding that. It's, um, it's not something I know a whole lot about. It, it has a lot of appeal to me um, on, on the surface. I think it, um, I don't think we know how to do it very well. Well, and it's difficult because it's like, it, it makes me think about like my life as a family physician where I really never know what I'm going to be dealing with. Um, having a, having a, uh, the right stories to be able to share could work in the right environment, but it's going to be hard for someone like a general practitioner like myself to have enough of those stories, perhaps. Now, in this case, if we're thinking about, we could probably come up with really effective stories specific to this particular issue today, right? Vaccine hesitancy or COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy. And I think that could be very powerful. Um, I, uh, I don't know, I haven't seen, um, I haven't seen people uh, organizing st stories or, or disseminating stories for this purpose, for this topic, um, but, I, but it'd be really interesting to see. Thank you. Uh, we've got some more coming in, so I'm not sure if we'll get to them all, but we'll go ahead and try. Uh, the next one is, do you think there is any link 
to mask adherence and high or lower acceptance to get the vaccine? Oh, well, um, yeah, I think there, I think there probably is. I, I don't know if I've seen those those data or not. That like a an association between people who are who are um, adherent to to face coverings um, is that the same group of people who are in who are open to getting vaccinated. My my I, my gut would say it probably is. Um, there's probably a, a very similar um, set of uh, or or set of understandings that would drive both of those behaviors. So I would guess there'd be a lot of overlap there. Um, someone else asked, do you think targeted ads like uh, some from the ad council are helpful in getting people to understand risk? Mm. Well, I'm not sure if I've, if I've seen the ones that you're talking about, um, the, the specific, those specific ads. I think what we one of the things we learned I think we knew this in the public health community before the pandemic, but I think we we saw saw it in in real time during the pandemic was that ads are pretty ineffective. Um, I I I don't know the data on the effectiveness of advertising, but in terms of the cost benefit ratio, uh, I think a lot of money was spent on ads, and I don't know how many uh, you know how how effective that was in changing people's hearts and minds around uh, around this, um, I just don't know. I think the approach that we took in, in my group um, at, at the clinic that I work at was um, that we really needed to, it was it really, we really boiled down to actually utilizing relationships and, and it required conversations. We had the first waves of people who, if you remember that, 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 um, that figure that I showed that showed um, like vaccine hesitancy as a spectrum. And on one hand, people who are willing to take anything that's recommended and on the other side was people who didn't want anything that was recommended. And then the people in between, um, you know, that the first few waves, we, we got overwhelmed with people who really wanted vaccinations, right? So they came rushing to, toward us and that was easy. Um, but then uh, as, as those people kind of used up resources. We started trying to figure out how to outreach to the others. And I don't think we, I don't think myself and many of my colleagues thought that advertising got very far with those groups. Um, those, those was, it turned out to be us kind of almost literally picking up the phone and calling particular patients who we knew um, were at risk and who were not who are not seeking vaccines and talking to them and doing kind of what I showed you here, which was starting with, you know, what are your concerns? What do you what have you heard? Can I share with you my perspective and doing that, doing that kind of dialogue with them? Uh, we have a very long, <laughs> and Margie, feel free to jump in. Okay, if you yeah, I'll be happy to. So we have a question, or just want some of your um, your take on this that you know that not all vaccine people are low health literate. Some people just flat out don't do it because of they uh, point to lack of transparency related con to conflict of interest. Uh, you know the changing leadership at FDA and CDC. Uh, there's reports, you know, founded or not, about bounties paid to hospitals for giving vaccinations, etc. So um, uh, also talks about drug companies refusing to disclose their data except under court order. <laughs> that not helping. So the basic question is, um, they're looking, they look to FLCC, Dr. Robert Malone, Peter McCullough, um, Peter, Pierre Corey, and they don't trust Dr. Fauci because the vaccines wear off and require multiple boosters. So just your thoughts on that. Well, yeah. So I think there's a couple of, oh, you know, there's many good points in there. One, at first, the first point that you make, which is that um, and I and I apologize if I made this if I link, made the linkage too strong that um, that vaccine hesitancy and and low health literacy are are tightly linked. I don't I don't know that, um, and I don't want to imply that um, because we, we we do know that vaccine hesitancy is very complicated, and I gave you a, that really overly simplified way of framing it just for our talk today. 
But right, many people who are who have more education than I have um, are very skeptical about vaccines. So, um, so I apologize for for making that linkage too too tight, perhaps. Um, uh, so then I think the many examples that you've included in this, I, I think to me all boil down around like how trust and where does trust come from? Where, how does, how does one, um, how does as a patient or a client or a consumer, how do you, how does that person find something that they can trust? And then, and then on the flip of that, as a healthcare professional, uh, how do I try to foster trust or, or, you know, or exude the things that a person would be looking for to be able to trust. It's very challenging, really hard. Trust, I think it, it really boils down to relationships. And as we're, I was, as we were talking about a, a few minutes ago, in terms of like ad campaigns, you know, ad campaigns, I don't think generate trust at all. I think you have to have a, probably a, um, some sort of a relationship and, in my world as a primary care provider, I, I think I have the luxury of being able to develop those relationships that often that may take a long time. Um, but I, I, I think that I, I, um, I get to benefit from that where maybe some, uh, some of my specialty colleagues who don't have those continuity relationships don't necessarily ever um, experience that same degree of trust. Uh, but I'd be curious, yeah, um, if others have ideas about how, uh, if trust is the is the critical missing piece there, what do we do about that? There's a lot of there's a lot of things I think in the talk here that we could point to, right? Like just poor communication in general, um, too information that's too complicated, information that's changing but but hasn't been framed in a way so that a person expects the information to change so that when we change our recommendations, it feels like we're saying that first recommendation was wrong and don't, and I wanted you to trust that back then, but now I want you to trust this new one rather than having said from the very beginning, our recommendations are going to change as we get new data. And just repeating that mantra over and over again could have really changed the way people experienced the, the recommendations that the, that the public health in, infrastructure was putting out. Um, this would be, a, I think this is like, this question is like perfect talk. We could have a whole nother hour discussion on it, I, which would be great. But I, I think let's try yeah. to see if we've got a time for one more question before we have to we end. We might have time for one real quick one. Um, let's see. Um, uh, okay. Um, given the challenges many people are, are re many people have reading due to literacy, aging, et cetera, and the ease of creating videos or audio options, it seems like many outlets for education still only focus on print. Do you see the need for more info in more accessible and engaging formats? Yeah, for sure. That's a great question. And we'll, we'll probably end on this one, mm -hmm. but um, I think this is like the emerging area, right? The um, like, like social media and um, technology platforms and uh, the fact that every single person has a computer with a with a uh, you know a TV monitor on it in their pockets these days, um, I think that's this is the wave of the future. Print print is um, works well for a certain subset uh, of the population, but as we can tell from looking at younger people, um, things like TikTok and other places are much more compelling um, and are much <laughs> and are much more engaging. Uh, and I think we'll, if we're, if we're wise and, and if we're fortunate to live in, uh, in a world like that, that we can imagine, we'll figure out how to use those kinds of platforms to, to share uh, important information. The trouble is, of course, is going to be that the volume of information coming in is still going to be overwhelming and that um, what you believe is, you know, the right information is going to be competing against um, what you might also label as misinformation, and we're going to always be contending with that. And, and that balance will be a pretty t difficult thing for us to probably uh, overcome. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. I just have a couple of really quick comments to wrap this up. Um, and I really do want to thank Dr. Coleman for that really interesting presentation. A lot of really great food for thought. 
uh, let me go ahead and share this screen. All right, so um, there's just a few items as I mentioned that I want, to men men I want to mention. So for instance, if you are interested in claiming medical library education, continuing education, or this, I have to get this right, consumer health education specialty or public health uh, continuing edu education credit for this session, uh, you will receive an email after the symposium ends with a questionnaire and instructions to claim CE. So this is uh, the last session for the day. So I wanna thank all of you for joining us. Um, this was a really great day, a great kickoff day for us. Uh, this is the last, as I mentioned, last session. So we do look forward to seeing you tomorrow for our keynote. Uh, we, will, we, have doc, we have Jevin West, and he's going to be speaking on the etiology of medical misinformation. And he is the co-author of Calling Bullshit, Data, Reasoning in a Digital World. We will start at 11.30 a.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. And finally, I just want to point out that if you're still interested in exploring more about uh, continuing, uh, if you want to still continue to explore health misinformation, join us for our new um, upcoming uh, health misinformation in health misinformation webinar series. In this uh, series, we will feature presentations from expert guest speakers and will enable librarians, public health professionals, health educators, and healthcare providers to explore various aspects of health misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation, and learn, practic learn practical and evidence-based solutions for how to identify it and help curb the spread. These uh, presentations will be scheduled intermittently throughout the year, and you can learn about up upcoming sessions by checking out the NNLM training calendar. So I want to, uh, again, thank all of you for coming, and you especially, Dr. Coleman, really appreciate you being part of our symposium. It's very interesting and lots of really good food for thought and uh, good ideas about how we can approach people going forward. Um, with misinformation. I have questions for you that I'll email you more about other vaccines, but uh, that's another topic for another day. So I do want to thank all of you, and I'm going to be ending the um, session right now. So thanks again, everyone. Thanks, everyone.